Hello, my name is Miles Zhang, and today I would like to discuss my experience of walking around in New York City. Now, I've spent many, many months and days walking around New York City streets from neighborhood to neighborhood, exploring New York City spontaneously and going wherever my heart takes me, almost as if there were no pre-formulated agenda. And through these walks, I feel that I've been able to draw bigger conclusions about New York City neighborhoods and the beauty and power of the New York City as a body. As E.B. White writes in his treatise on walking in New York City, called Here is New York, he writes that, quote, the city is like poetry. It compresses all life, all races and breeds, and adds music and the accompaniment of internal engines. The island of Manhattan is, without any doubt, the greatest human concentrate on Earth, the poem whose magic is comprehensible to millions of permanent residents, but whose full meaning will always remain elusive. And walking, for me, for me, walking in New York City is part of this music, part of what E.B. White would describe as the accompaniment of internal engines, where there is this kind of machinery to New York City machinery of an urban body, where each citizen, each resident of New York, is one key, one brick in this great wall of what makes this urban life. And in the sense, the community of New York City is what I find the most powerful aspect, the idea that each individual is a part of something greater, a part of the New York, a living, breathing microcosm. And walking in New York City neighborhoods, I also see that each neighborhood is a microcosm unto itself within the greater microcosm that is New York City. And that, in a certain sense, New York is not one continuous body. Not one continuous body. Rather, it is a grouping of many villages and worlds, each one unto itself, where, incredibly, neighborhoods maintain individuality despite proximity and how they may have separate infrastructure of transportation, amenities, eateries, groceries, and then a distinct culture and a distinct architecture, but then finally, above all, distinct people. And it's almost incredible for me to walk through New York City and to see rapid changes in how a neighborhood and a people look within very few blocks of each other. Almost as if, as E.B. White writes, that the terrain of New York is such that a resident sometimes ends up traveling farther, in the end, than a commuter. Only three or four miles in length is like going three times around the world. And, end quote, for me, New York City is almost as if it were a world expo, where walking from one street to the next, one sees and experiences so many different cultures, where almost the collision and intermingling of these millions and millions of people that represent all these different corners of the world create, in a sense, the permanent place, the best place for the United Nations, a place where peace and a certain degree of tranquility emerges in the greater urban body, and how, despite the out outward trappings of crime and callousness of New Yorkers, inside there is this great kind of diversity, the circus of urban life, the peace of all these different, diverse, and disparate neighborhoods, all existing in generally peaceful coexistence. And as part of this peaceful coexistence, each neighborhood has its own culture and people, where the city is really the composite of tens of thousands of all these neighborhoods, where, although the neighborhoods may be different in size, it is that each neighborhood is, in a sense, self-sufficient, where one has, for example, Madison Square Park versus Washington Square Park, the Madison Square Park of the businessmen, the stockbroker, the trader on his lunch break, scurrying back to the office to make some more money. And then in Washington Square Park, the hippie park, that exists independently, yet only a few blocks away, where one has a completely different kind of clientele, that of the university student, the homeless person, the local, the local radical, the hippie, or the performer. And for me, it's incredible how two neighborhoods represented by two parks can coexist simultaneously, independently, and in a certain sense, peacefully. Or, for example, 
One has the Upper East or the Upper West Side. These two distinct neighborhoods, each one with its own kind of culture. The Upper East Side, a more perhaps uptight and conservative feeling neighborhood. Then only a few blocks away, the Upper West Side, a neighborhood for perhaps say more of a nouveau, nouveau riche kind of clientele. A neighborhood that emulates, in a certain sense, the wealth and power of its East Side cousin. Or for example, I go to the East and West villages and see how these two neighborhoods, despite their similar names and their proximity, have a distinct culture, each one different, unique, in its own indescribable kind of way. Perhaps a uniqueness that none even E.B. White could capture in his beautiful prose. Or, for example, I walk from Morningside Heights in Colombia to El Barrio, and I see that there is this, this great divide between the two, and how the Ivy League bubble of the university hardly corresponds to the outward realities of El Barrio, and how both of them may be, in a certain sense, their own bubbles. The bubble of privilege versus the bubble, the bubble of poverty. And walking through these neighborhoods, beyond seeing the differences between them, I realize that within each neighborhood, there are the specific focal points of the neighborhood that alter and change depending on how the neighborhood evolves and on the time of day. For example, there is the subway station, the place that people congregate around on the weekdays, and then the major intersection, and then on weekends, the city park, or the grocery store, or barbershop. So each neighborhood is almost further divided into even smaller and smaller cellular units. The cellular unit of the community, of the building, the city park, or even the small corner store. Or I walk around and see how within each neighborhood, the neighborhood pocket park reflects its respective neighborhood, and how, although there may be one city government and one parks department, it were as if there were 10,000 different parks, each one part of a different world, each one reflecting its unique kind of community. For example, the Central Park, f frequented by tourists in the lower reaches and locals in the upper reaches, or the Madison Square Park of the businessman and trader, similar to Battery Park, or Thompson Square Park in Washington Square Park of the hippies in the 1970s, or then finally Union Square for the constant circus, the market, the square that's constantly changing and evolving. And I see, walking from park to park, that like a living, living neighborhood, like a living, breathing network, neighborhoods all grow and contract with time. And how, for example, there's the Little Italy, of old versus the Chinatown of new, and how these two neighborhoods, in a certain sense, reflect the changing demographics of New York. The little Italy of old, of old immigrants, of an older America moving out and gradually being replaced by the burgeoning, growing Chinatown of new. Or, for example, I see the West Village and the NYU, and how the two of them are in this battle of wits, this battle to take over the neighborhood and how they're growing and contracting, almost like living beings, fighting amongst each other. Or I see Harlem and the Upper West East Side, how these two neighborhoods, although only a few blocks apart, divided by only a few streets, are almost as if they were different worlds. The Harlem of poverty and reliance on government aid, and then the Upper East Side, the bastion of privilege, in itself a separate kind of bubble. And above all, I perhaps see this trend of gentrification versus old growth, of how the old New York remains, it hangs on like Little Italy, or like the West Village, and hanging on in the face of gentrification and old growth. And perhaps as a part of that, I see that neighborhood redevelopment behaves according to set rules, where there is in the beginning the impoverished neighborhood oftentimes in need of redevelopment and change. And then, initially, the maverick artist type moves in, in search of cheap rents, in search of a unique neighborhood, and in search, ultimately, of inspiration. And then, as the artist type moves in, the neighborhood becomes trendy and distinctive, and finally becomes fashionable. And redevelopment speeds up. And then, almost ironically in the end, the neighborhood loses the very character, the very thing, 
that very indescribable element that made it fashionable to start with, its culture. For example, a Dumbo or a Soho that are no longer the bastions of the artist type, but have evolved into bastions of consumerism. Or the Green Point of Brooklyn, or the Brooklyn Heights, distinctive neighborhoods that lose their character or the, the adversity as they are redeveloped. And almost ironically, the neighborhood redevelopment ac behaves according to the set rules where there is almost a rule that the neighborhood loses its essential character the moment it becomes popular. But although the neighborhoods themselves may change, the essential character of New York remains the same. In the 1930s, E.B. White, write, White writes in his book that the glib barker on the sightseeing bus tells his passengers that this is the street of lost souls, but this street, the Bowery, does not see itself as lost. It meets its particular problem in its own way. Plenty of gin mills, plenty of flop houses, plenty of, diff of indifference, and always, at the end of the line, the morgue. And I see that perhaps although the Bowery would be quite the opposite today than what it was 50 years ago, that spirit of the Bowery, that spirit of neighborhoods, of streets, where the urban detritus is pushed off to the side, is sidelined at the edge of urban life, at its very fringes, that spirit still survives, albeit in different neighborhoods, on 125th Street, in the South Bronx, in the outer reaches of New York. In fact, walking along these neighborhoods, I realized that sometimes, just sometimes, a neighborhood is almost an arbitrary construct the purposes of navigation and city planning, where, contrary to the maps that neatly divide the city into grids and wards, neighborhoods in fact coalesce, they merge and grow with time, like Chinatown and Little Italy, where functionally each individual may have her own neighborhood, that of her own apartment house, her street, her subway line, into workplace or school, and that in a certain sense there are neighborhoods on multiple levels. There is the neighborhood, the community grouping of the individual, which grows and morphs with time. And then there is the neighborhood of the community, which can shrink or grow. And then finally, there is the neighborhood as defined by city government, which is set, which divides the city into wards and districts and precincts. And perhaps I feel that, in a very, in a very abstract sense, New York is almost ungovernable and uncontrollable, and how, although the city government may control the day-to-day -day workings of the city, there is a certain spirit, a certain essence to the urban life that no city government or no individual can capture in words, language, poetry, or prose. As E.B. White writes, it is a miracle that New York works at all. The whole thing is implausible. Every time the residents brush their teeth, millions of gallons of water must be drawn from the Catskills in the hills of Westchester. The subterranean system of telephone cables, power lines, steam pipes, gas mains, and sewer pipes is reason enough to abandon the island to the gods and weevils. And I feel that, end quote, the city functions independently of its operators. Although city government may be directly responsible on a micro scale for directing traffic, subways, and demolishing neighborhoods. But ultimately, the city does not control how the city functions on the more important macro scale, where the city is really governed indirectly by the millions of people living there, or by the millions of individuals, each one, as earlier described, a brick in the greater wall that is the urban body. And in a certain sense, city government has its own way of understanding the city, its own way of governing New York, but the city itself is almost as if it were an independent microcosm. And walking and reading about New York City, I, I also feel that New York City may have a distinctive notion of progress, progress in quote marks, where the inhabitants' perception of progress has grown more pessimistic, where I look at the New York City of 50 or America or the world of 100 years ago, and I see a place that has this naive belief 
that the progress is found in industrialization in the future, where all change is inevitably good change. And then I look at the New York City today, and I see perhaps a more pessimistic notion of progress, the idea that the future of New York City may not necessarily be better than the present, where not necessarily all change is for the better. And perhaps today, in the New York of today, there is a more nuanced understanding of progress, where progress is not necessarily inevitable, and that it is, in a certain sense, beyond the control of both individual and government. But the city, as E.B. White writes, makes up for its hazards and deficiencies by supplying its citizens with massive doses of a supplementary vitamin, a sense of belonging to something unique, cosmopolitan, mighty, and unparalleled. And perhaps it is this magical kind of X factor that goes or transcends this notion of progress of the neighborhood or city government that makes New York City magical. The magic of walking on the street and simultaneously seeing so many different neighborhoods, yet all of which are part of the greater urban body. I also feel that walking around New York City, City despite the existence of so many different disparate neighborhoods, it is almost as if the grid were the defining feature of transportation and partially of identity where one can solely, by stating one's address, inadvertently reveal one's social class, or an address at, say, Park Avenue in 100th is being something very different from an address at Park Avenue in 90th, whereas one may denote poverty or, or, or the trappings of an immigrant neighborhood, the other may denote the bubble of wealth and privilege. And so I feel that, in a certain sense, the grid perpetuates these generalizations and stereotypes of neighborhoods. Or also, the grid, in a certain sense, resembles a set of Cartesian coordinates of X, Y, and Z, superimposed over the grid, over the world of the neighborhood. Now, walking on the New York City sidewalk, I see perhaps a certain code of conduct, where there is a flow to city streets that, like traffic flow, obeys set rules. One walks on the right, with one's head down, scuffling one's feet, where the direction of sidewalk travel reflects commuting patterns, as if, if, as if each individual were a car in the greater urban traffic jam. Or, for example, on the sidewalks, I see that one can almost tell the day of the week by what people are wearing. On Monday through Friday, there are the lone businessmen and women in ties and their suits, scuttling along. Or how on Saturday and Sunday, the city is more relaxed kind of pall settles over the city, where it is casual, where one sees the family dressed for its Sunday best, promenading on the city streets. Or how, in a certain sense, in the bigger picture, sidewalk activities reflect the time of day, the morning deliveries of the businessmen of the, from the outer boroughs and the immigrants, and then the morning commute of the wealthier individuals, scuttling to their workplace, scuttling to Wall Street or Midtown, to make more money in the giant stock market that is New York in the globalized world. And then, as the day winds down, one sees the midday lull and break, where commuters, where the businessmen sit in parks like Madison's Park and City Hall Park, lunching and dining and waiting for the day to wind down. Then finally, the tired and wet and soggy evening commute back to the outer boroughs of the city. Now, aside from this, as part of this uh, sidewalk code of conduct, I almost feel that New Yorkers engage in this collective form of ignorance, perhaps ignorance of the homeless, of the unsightly, of the impoverished beggars. One walk, how when one walks on the sidewalk, one sees the homeless there, and one puts one's head up ahead, and looks straight ahead, as if that individual did not even exist, as if that individual did not even merit one's attention. And it is this perhaps dangerous kind of collective ignorance, that sidelines whole strata of the New York population, how, in a certain sense, it illustrates how there are different kinds of New Yorks. And, as E.B. White writes, that there are roughly three New Yorks. There's the New York of the businessmen and commuter, who is ubiquitous and disengaged from their environment. They go in one day and out the other, 
almost unaware of the neighborhoods and communities and people that live in the vicinity of where they work. And then secondly, there are the locals who are distinctive and engaged the defining features of the communities, ever present and willing to fight for the neighborhoods and environment that they are accustomed to. And then finally, thirdly, there are the tourists and the homeless, individuals who are ubiquitous and in a certain sense in invisible. Invisible in that they're avoided. Invisible that, when, that the New Yorker walks right by them. Perhaps in a certain sense oblivious to the homeless man's plight or oblivious to the dangers of ignoring them. And as E.B. White later expands, he writes that New York City is a city of autonomous activities, how the city can seamlessly absorb large national events, and how there can be a parade one day, and how it does not even absorb the entire city, and how one can walk even a few blocks away, and life continues as normal, and how there can be simultaneously countless hundreds of thousands of different activities in the greater body, in the greater community that is the urban life. And perhaps there is a certain danger to the urban life, and that is the danger of this interstitial zone between the citizen who is fully known and also fully invisible, where one is in constant contact with millions of people. I walk down the city streets and I see thousands and millions and hundreds of people, where everything is available, all the amenities that this great metropolis can offer. Yet, in a greater sense, one is anonymous because one can hide in the large numbers of the crowd. And that is both the beauty and the curse of urban life. It is the beauty of urban life in that one can be with fellow pedestrians, observe them, without necessarily having to communicate with them. Yet it is also a certain kind of invisibility, of isolation, and anonymity in this urban body. The dehumanizing element of being only one among millions. And in a certain sense, walking on the New York City street and vanishing between the cracks, slipping between them, almost as if the urban detritus or homeless individual does, is a certain kind of death, a kind of death where one disappears, where one vanishes and becomes merely a ghost in the urban body. And ultimately, I think that that is part of the danger to this urban life, that however beautiful on the outside has a certain darkness on the inside. As E.B. White writes that New York blends the gift of privacy with the excitement of participation, and better than most dense communities, it succeeds in insulating the individual." End quote. And perhaps in conclusion, looking at New York City, I see this certain continuity, that although the trappings of urban life may change, where people live, where people work, the look of a neighborhood, the tools people use, and the era people live in, although these trappings may vary and evolve with, with time, the essential nature of the urban life remains, how there's a certain continuity and essential nature to New York City. And, for example, I read about old New York City, and the New York described by E.B. White and Walt Whitman is just as applicable to the New York of today as it was to the New York of several decades or centuries ago. And E.B. White writes and believes this in his text. Whitman further writes in his one of his poems, in one of his beautiful pieces of prose, he writes, Flow on, river, flow with the flood tide, and ebb with the ebb tide. Frolic on, crested and scallop-edged waves. Gorgeous clouds of the sunset, drench with their splendor, me or the men and women, generations after me. And I feel that New York is representative of this urban body, of this great tide, where almost each individual, where a small cellular unit, or each community, where a small puddle, a small droplet, and a larger river that is the urban life of New York City. Thank you.